Hey everybody, um, first of all, I'm Janet Taylor and just wanted to thank you all for participating in the webinar for NAEA, um, Creating a Studio Environment. Um, I know that I really appreciated you all attending and there were a ton of amazing questions and I thought the best way to actually answer them might be in a video format so I can kind of talk you through it. Um, sometimes it's easier for me to talk through it than to sit and type for a long period of time because there were a lot of really good questions. I actually um, went through and kind of clumped them into categories. So um, what I'm going to do today is um, kind of go through those for you and then hopefully um, that will answer some questions. I'm sure it'll provoke some more questions. So please feel free to email me, reach out to me. Um, if you have any questions, I'm really happy to help. I'm not always like an immediate responder, but I will do my best to get back to you, especially with um, as we all kind of navigate what the fall is going to be looking like. Um, it might be pretty busy for a, a lot of us. Um, Okay, so first and foremost, a couple people have asked, like, where can I find those presentations that you were talking about um, during the presentation? So I did a presentation on the interactive gallery or how to break it down, that um, pre-conference um, presentation I gave on how to break it down for your classroom in different content-specific areas. Those are all on that handout. It's a PDF document, everything is linked, so you should be able to just click on all those different areas um, to help you get insight into kind of my approach. Now, there are a ton of resources out there. There's a lot of amazing um, people who've gone through this journey, um, and of course the, the founders of all of um, TAB. So there's just a lot of different resources. What I provided for you are just, um, kind of deeper dive or better explanations or clarifications on how I approach this, okay? Um, so there's just so much content, it's really hard to um, talk about it in such a short amount of time or even in one presentation. Um, so hopefully what I can give to you is at least a base or a foundation. And then um, from there, it's gonna take some, like I said, some time to figure out what's gonna work for you. You do have to feel confident in your teaching that you're gonna you're gonna get this um, so one of the um, questions that came up to me a lot was like you know um, well okay let's dive in I'm not even gonna go there okay let's dive in so I have um, a handout here that um, basically I like I said I categorize things so the first one is kind of a general setup of the classroom, like how did I start this, um, and maybe some logistics of the setup. And then creating artwork, there were a lot of questions on how do you um, provide prompts or how do you um, get students to think about ideas. Materials and clean up, materials came up a lot. Um, logistics of like the nitty gritty little things. So I'm gonna go through that as well, all those questions. Grading assessment feedback, those were a, another big question. Um, I actually had submitted a proposal for an NAEA presentation on my grading practices with, um, combined with Jean Bjork, so we'll see you know, if we have that in the spring. Um, but regardless, um, I'm thinking about um, providing some sort of resource for that for you guys as well because, again, that all looks so different. But I'll try to answer your questions the best I can. Alignment, like vertical alignment starting in elementary and middle school. And then some kind of like other stuff I just wanted to, I know there were questions that I didn't know how to categorize them, so I kind of stuck them in there. And then the big looming question was about COVID. So I definitely want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to provide for you is literally a um, screen share of my canvas sites so maybe like one of my classes so that you can see like this is how i set it up um, i thought it would be way easier to show you instead of like trying to explain it um, and then you can kind of see how i scaffold that and how i open and unlock or open and lock certain things okay um, so this is actually probably going to take just as long or if not longer than the presentation to answer all of your questions. Um, so hopefully here we go. All right. 
So the questions that came up for setup was, how transparent were you with your students as you transitioned to choice-based learning? So what I did um, as I transitioned, I had a small sculpture class and my small sculpture class was of 10 students. And then I had, um, because they wouldn't allow me to run a class of just 10 students, I also taught at the same time, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but at the same time I taught a ceramics one class with 18 kids. Normally our ceramics are, um, it's in one classroom. We have 18 spots, right, for hand building for level ones. And then we have a whole wheel section. So two, three, fours get to use the wheel. Um, and handbell can have like a combo. Um, and so uh, what we did for this particular situation is we capped only at level ones in this one class. And then my classroom and the ceramics classroom have a door through <laughs> to get to. So I literally taught the two classes um, simultaneously in two different rooms. I know that's also crazy. Um, but it worked because, and I said it was okay to make this work, because those 10 kids were kids that already had been through our program, were established. I knew almost all of them already from having them previously. Um, and what I did was I started by experimenting with them. Okay, so when I started to figure out tab um, and choice, I was like, what does this look like? Um, and I got really excited about revamping. And what I did was I offered those opportunities to those students by explaining this completely um, as I am right now, right? So I sat in front of them and I said, okay, here's the thing, guys. Um, I'm really excited about this new approach and I really think it'll work with you guys because um, you're a small class and you're really thoughtful. And so I want to see, and if it doesn't work or if things are not going in the direction we want it to go, we will just change plans and that's okay. Um, and so they were like, yeah, okay, let's try it. So I started off um, teaching them uh, with more overarching prompts. So in my sculpture class, so every class that I set up content-based does look different. So tab for or tab or choice for sculpture looks different than it does for ceramics as it does for photography. It's just because the way the content is delivered, it's different, right? In photography, you might be all doing the same uh, media, right? But in sculpture, you're using all sorts of different media. And I want them to be confident in each one of those media choices before they move on to exploring any option that they want. Um, whereas in photography, you're kind of building all along the way, if that makes sense. So in sculpture, um, I set it up originally for them to say, um, here's what you need to be, we're gonna be focusing on multiples or um, assemblage pieces, right? And so I gave them a theme at the time to consider and we talked about that theme. And I will tell you that as I went through, it was hard for me. It was hard for me, um, my biggest, um, kind of outbreak or what, what do I want to say, um, like aha moment was that when we got to the plaster piece. So I wanted my students to learn how to do abstract, uh, subtractive carving using plaster. And so I gave them um, additive, right, little maquettes that they did out of clay. And then um, we tried with floral foam doing subtractive so that they could have that low risk practice. And then they did the plaster. Um, which was, you know, that's a big deal because if something breaks, it's scary for them. It's high risk. So um, in that, we started with how do our artists observe um, and or artists create by observations or something like that, right? Artists observe. And so I was really in my mind, I thought I want them to observe nature. They're going to do like biomorphic figures, something like that. And what happened was when I opened up the dialogue to my students to say, how do artists observe? On the whiteboard, we wrote down all these areas and they came up with things like, you know, by interviews, by listening, by, you know, tasting things, by talking to each other. I, I was so um, kind of amazed by how open their minds were to this question when I had had this idea because I'd always been teaching this way. Like, this is what we're going to create. Um, and so they, um, students started coming up with some, some of them did this biomorphic or, you know, an abstraction of a nature, um, item. 
other kids did things that were way more abstract than I ever would have thought. Like some student was struggling with the um, crisis in Syria at the time. And so she did a combination of a, the um, mountainscape with like the flag um, carved in with like people inside. I mean, it was just incredible. Another student was dealing with, obviously at the time, this was six years ago um, and po politics were still an issue. And so he then, right, so he did like the national, um, the Washington Monument. He carved in these chain links and he played with paint to see how, I mean, it was kind of incredible, right? So um, through that process of having that smaller class that I trusted them and they trusted me and we could do this together, um, that is what pushed me to see immediately that this could work. Um, when I talk to my students in general now, um, any level ones or any upper levels that I'm like instilling this practice with, um, I am very open about it in the beginning and I say, this class is probably gonna look a little different than what you're used to and I'm going to be asking you to trust me and I'm gonna ask you to take risks and feel good about it. Um, and that, that and, and right in day one I tell them my, my intention is for you to learn and to grow and to take these skills with you beyond this classroom. And I think, you know, the more I talk about it in the beginning and really make it very explicit that this is my goal and this is our goal and we're in this together, I really do think that they have that sense of ownership of the classroom and the curriculum and and it, it, they relax, you know? Um, so yes, so I am very transparent about that. Um, did you present your intention uh, for your changes to the arts uh, in the art studio pedagogy with admin or parents? Okay, so yes and no. So I talked to my fine arts chair at the time. Um, well, he still is, um, but I talked to him when I first was wanting to do this. I really want to try this. What do you think? And he's like, "Go for it," because it was just my sculpture class, and they were kind of small, and you know, it's it's not a big deal. Um, but then when I saw results right away. Um, my and and others saw those results i could start to integrate it into other classes um, sometimes i feel like if we're trying to push an agenda through um, you're going to get a lot of pushback so instead it's probably better to kind of integrate it into your practice a little at a time and then be able to show those results from that so that um, people are more and more convinced or understanding of what you're trying to do right one thing that my colleague had said to, to us after maybe a year or two of me doing this, a lot of people were like, oh, well, Jan, it's choice. And she said, well, we all use choice in our classroom. And I think that was a big point to remind everybody that you do. We all use choice in our classroom. It's just that choice continuum of how much and how little. The, the goal is to always be able to get them to as much autonomy as possible. Um, and so... She was just pointing out that we all use choice is just, you know, not always to full choice. Um, and so how do we get them there? Um, my admin also probably thinks I'm a little crazy. They haven't really talked to me. I have to say um, I, they haven't talked to me about it. Um, they know I present all the time about it. Um, and I have to say that, again, in arts, this is the one thing that we're lucky about is that we get to have some autonomy. Um, and so, you know, people are so focused on standardized tests that um, sometimes we get to have a little more freedom to do that. The other thing that I want to say, uh, make sure you understand, is that my curriculum is still very aligned to our district curriculum. So we have two high schools in our district, and they both um, need to align as far as our standards and what our content that we're delivering. Um, everything I do is aligned to that. It's just structured differently. Um, and, and maybe my focus is a little different, right? Like what I want out of it or my outcomes, right? Um, so I've never had questions from parents or admin. I'll be honest with you about it. Um, how do you introduce this to your students at the beginning of the year? I think I just covered that. So hopefully that um, explained that enough. Um, with Darkroom, how do you foster building that toolbox? For example, small groups, rotating, etc. cetera. Um, so I think... Uh, you know what? I might show the example of my um, photography class. That might be the easiest one for everybody to kind of grasp, maybe. Um, so I'll show that. How do you manage when many students need to 
do their demo technique at the same time. So it is challenging. I'm not going to lie. Um, you have to be very good at juggling and you have to be okay with students. Um, might like you, you have to be available to say, okay, if I need to demo to this group and this group needs a demo too, then I have to be available to say, um, that group needs to be busy with something else. So whatever that is, maybe it's, um, taking time to work on their sketchbook cover or, you know, the demos that I do are very short. Um, and so the waiting period isn't very long, I guess I would say. Um, so you kind of have to juggle that. I do definitely, um, in the beginning of the school year, I'll tell you, I plan like my first month out like day by day of how I'm going to manage all of the beginning because the beginning is the hardest because um, there's so much content that students need at different levels and different materials and stuff like that. Um, but then it gets way easier as, t as the semester goes on. I will be honest about that. Um, but um, students get pretty used to because they are very self-paced. So I might teach a demo to one group. For example, my jewelry medals, I think I said in the um, uh, presentation, I might teach a group how to load a saw blade. And then this group over here needs to learn how to use the chasing or whatever mallets um, to form metal, for example, right? Um, so the loading saw blade, if a kid gets further advanced in that and fast and they're really good at it, which usually they're not within that first day, um, then they get to move on to something in their toolbox. So it could be their challenge or another quiz or another something that they're learning in. So that's the great thing about the toolboxes. If you have all that front loaded instruction, you can always say, great, you moved on, you can go and do this. Sometimes if that other team is waiting for me, I might say, watch a video on this or take a quick look ahead at your challenge so you know what it is that we're trying to be doing. So it's all about managing and allowing some flexibility in that. Um, okay, so that's the first section. The second section I have is creating artwork. So once we get through the toolboxes and students learn all their techniques and their concepts and stuff that they need, how do you get them into the artwork phase? So um, the question that came up was, can you explain how tab is driven by a prompt? So again, um, tab choice is not driven by really anything. The prompt is there to like any, um, anything, any teaching pedagogy is often driven by some sort of prompt, right? So I would look at it more at that. Um, but how you can set it up to drive by a prompt is that, um, so a lot of times teaching for artistic behaviors, you will think of things like artists do this, right? This is how artists think. This is how artists see. Um, so your prompt, my prompts changed from, um, like do this, right? Or, you know, let's talk about this that's going to fit into my particular project. And it turned more open-ended. So instead, like my sculpture example from earlier, um, instead of saying like, we're going to, my prompt is how do you abstract nature? Instead, it becomes how do artists observe? And so from that, and that's in the artwork phase, right? So prior to that, in that sculpture toolbox, we had a lot of different little prompts along the way that are more structured and more practice and whatever. But when we get to the artwork phase, uh, students have more options in that. So what I do often is I will give three options. And I think I, think I might have mentioned this in the presentation, but I usually set this up as three options um, where students are looking at the question, one prompt is aesthetic based. One is uh, more abstract, um, but more related to like maybe pop culture or something that their um, students are particularly um, invested in, in their bubble. And then I go and the third prompt is usually something more global or community based. So um, something that might be like um, in my photography, I'll show that example today. So you can kind of see how I broke that up, okay? Um, but those prompts, but then a lot of students, another question came up with like, um, how can you help students identify what they want to create or what concepts, uh, they want to, their artwork to address. So the other question is, um, all in this planning phase. So not only do we have these prompts that might be very vague and open-ended and might give some examples of what that might look like. I always give, I don't give like 
in the beginning when I used to teach, I used to give all these examples. And I just felt like that was kind of putting students in a box of this is what I need it to look like. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I changed it. So then I show like very few prompts and I will, or examples. And so what I might show is how an artist does this, or I might show a video of them talking about it. Um, I try to give like as few examples as possible, but I do want them to have some concrete, tangible thing that they can put their finger on because I know that's really hard to ask them to come up with those really big ideas um, off the top of their head. So, um, uh, so back to that is um, how do you like come up with that or how do you get the students to identify that? So um, I do a lot of mind mapping, a lot of idea uh, generating practice with students. Um, we do this again, probably in the, if I have, let's say I have two or three big toolbox projects that I want. Usually I have like a couple toolboxes before a challenge. So let's say I have three challenges, which are like projects along the way. Um, which are the stepping stones to their artwork. Um, usually in the second or third is when I start to identify um, talking more about like mind mapping or idea generation, or I um, do a more robust um, practice there so that students understand all these different ways that they can come up with ideas. So that when we get to the artwork phase, they have an idea of how to generate ideas or at least where to go to to try some things. Um, so we do a lot of that. Um, I do have an artist proposal for students too, or an artwork proposal, um, where they um, fill out some information and they have to do that before they can um, start an artwork because a lot of times it'll, it helps them think through the entire process. So sometimes they're like, well, I want, really want to create this um, piece of jewelry and it's like you know this big and um, it's got like multiple layers and then I want to add all these things on it and you're like well how okay but what skills do you have so far that can get you to that point it's okay to take risks and go above and beyond but really and and what are some of our constraints and limitations so you can't do something this big because we don't have the funds for metal <laughs> that big, nor are you technically able to solder or something that big. Like you're just not at that point and that's okay. So how can we adjust for our constraints and limitations that we have? I'm not saying no, I'm saying we need to reflect and think about how to come up with these ideas and how are these ideas gonna be actual feasible, you know? I always say to students when they say, well, I have this idea, but I don't think I can do it because it's too much. I'm like, come to me with your biggest grandiose idea and then we can talk about your limitations. You can kind of whittle it down from there, but um, don't restrain yourself or constrain yourself in the first um, portion of idea generation. Um, are your projects theme-based? If so, can you give some examples? I think I gave a couple examples like, um, you know, uh, artists observe, artists um, take a stand, artists, um, use repetition. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I can show you some examples too, but um, basically those are kind of the themes. I don't, again, I don't try to pigeonhole. Here's the thing. I used to do things like, you know, we're going to talk today about your identity and you're going to focus on that. Well, some students are still just do not feel comfortable talking about their identity for multiple of reasons. And I want them to feel that they can explore whatever it is. Um, to make meaningful art. To me, it doesn't matter that they're just focusing on identity. Sure, are they going to be exposed to artists that talk about identity? Are they going to look at and think about how they could portray something in identity? Yes, but do they have to make an artwork about identity? No, I don't really think that's um, the point of my art class, you know. Um, can you briefly explain your approach to helping students come up with their own ideas for art making. Okay, I think I kind of did. Um, I'm sorry, I should have maybe put those two <laughs> questions together. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. How do you integrate themes and big ideas? Um, again, I like to have these bigger, broader ideas, but give some artwork examples, artists that talk about that. Um, 
I start that in earlier in the toolbox. We don't just um, do no conceptual thinking and then all of a sudden, bam, you have to come up with all your ideas. I really do scaffold that conceptual piece. I think that's really, really important. And I think um, that that will make sense to you as you start to develop that. Um, which artists do you look at from the contemporary period that you feel are important for our diverse student body? That's a really great question. There are so many. Um, what I would love to do is put together some sort of resource document um, and maybe we could all share it and like a Google Doc and we can keep adding to it that we can all use. So I'd be happy to um, create something like that and then I'll give you guys the link to that and then um, we can all kind of work on that. I'm sure um, Rebecca can post the link to that as well so you guys can access. Um, and then, do you ever have students who tread water in toolboxes and don't make full artworks? How do you encourage them to make that leap? So here's the thing about the artwork that's interesting. Um, students really want to make artwork. Um, if they feel like they're not making, so the way I structure it is not like, here's a toolbox and now you have to make, or here's a bunch of little toolboxes all semester and now just make a big artwork. I really do structure the, size of the artwork. So let me go back to my jewelry metals class if that's okay for an example. So my first toolbox that I might talk about um, or first couple toolboxes that kind of build up the first challenge um, in metals. So they have to make a sketchbook. They do a sketchbook cover with um, collage pieces to help them think about um, 2D artwork and composition and to explore media and to loosen up. But then we might move into, um, like I said, two different challenges. And those two different challenges have multiple toolboxes that are kind of aligned to each one. So in one toolbox, I might have um, sawing and piercing. And then another toolbox, I might have forming wire. And so in those toolboxes, um, students in, in the sawing and, uh, sawing and piercing one, Students learn how to load a saw blade, saw, they do little practice pieces. Um, we then, they look at the challenge and we talk about 2D composition, hence the sketchbooks, it's like totally transferable, about focal point. Um, we talk about negative and positive space and layers and whatnot um, and textures, right? So all of those go into that challenge where students then come up with ideas. They really do want to get to that point where they're making that little piece. It's not substantial. It's not overwhelming. Um, it is doable. And that is really important to meet your students where they're at. They are not able to make a full artwork yet. You have not taught them or supported them in how to do that. The other group is working on forming. So they are forming like an expressive line um, bracelet or I first only said you can only do a bracelet. And then I'm like, that's silly, let's give them choice. Some students wanna do a ring, some wanna do some like crazy pendant thing, some wanna do some earrings, fine, whatever. I don't really care. You're learning the techniques and you're learning the ideas. So then those two, two groups, when they're when wire forming is finished, they move on to the sawing and forming and those or sawing and piercing, and those kids will help teach those kids, right? And then vice versa. Now all of those kids are learning these foundational skills, sawing and piercing um, and refining, right? Sheet metal, forming and refining wire, and then they can take that information move on to the next one, which is harder. It's like learning how to solder sheet metal, right? How to, how to solder things together. Once they get that, they have to come up with a set. So no longer is it just one and one. It's like, now you have to come up with a, like a little set that, um, of soldered pieces, right? So they're coming up with designs and they're starting to think more about their interests and explore that. And it's not just about the project. Um, so, they don't really tread water. They really do push each other. And I, I do see that um, when I used to teach projects, students would kind of dilly dally, you know, you always get those kids that you're like, everybody's finished, but you, and you, you know, partially maybe because you were frozen and felt intimidated or you couldn't make choices, or this is just kind of anxiety producing and hard for you. Um, but what happens in a choice-based classroom is that students 
are um, really inspired by each other. They are like kind of, you know, they'll be working and they'll be like looking out. Oh, like that's what they're, oh, what, what are you doing over there? And then they start engaging in conversations. It truly is. I don't know how to say this. It has nothing to do with me, right? It is setting up this environment and students will engage with each other and then they start to want to make those artworks. If they feel stuck, sometimes they feel frozen or stuck, I repeatedly remind them, this is just a project. And I say just, you know, just to kind of take that off. It's okay if it doesn't turn out. This is how we're going to learn. This is how you're going to take what you learn and apply it to your artwork later. And even that, if you take a risk and you don't, and you quote unquote fail, who cares? Like you're learning. That's what the point of the class is, is to learn. And I use this language so much um, that students really take a lot of pride in their work because they are, they do feel excited to create because it's okay if they if it doesn't turn out, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Um, so I don't know what to say about like having students tread water, except for that. Um, I do feel like it's all about that scaffolding and providing them comfort, making it comfortable for them. Um, the other thing I wanted to say that didn't come up, but it comes up a lot in other presentations is how long do you give them to make an artwork and how many artworks do you have them make? Um, so it, let's say if we're doing about half a semester to uh, around, give or take half a semester in toolboxes and then the other half the semester's artworks. I used to say, well, you have to make three artworks by the end of the semester. And then students were like rushing, you know? Some students were making really small pieces and making them, like getting finished with them quickly. Some students were making really elaborate, really neat pieces that took a lot longer. It, so I tell my students, our goal is to make two to three artworks. If, you know, based on what you're doing, um, I will allow you to count that as a second or third artwork. So um, that way, it's an individual person by person kind of case. Um, and then the students know again and trust that they can take their time and develop what they're interested in. And if students finish fast, they get excited. I'm like, you want to make another something else? Go for it. And they're like, okay, yes, I, I totally do. And sometimes they want to make a gift for a friend and whatever. They're still practicing those skills and that's okay, you know? Um, so that's about creating artwork. Okay, material and cleanup. Curious about ownership of cleanup process of stations. Yeah, so um, kids are kids. It, you're gonna, you're like, hey, let's clean up, let's clean the tables, don't forget, let's do this, let's do that, right? So and so, please grab a paper towel, wipe down your table. I constantly am using language like, we are together, this is a studio environment, we work together. Hey, help your friends out, help your peer out. Who's at your table mate, who can help you? Oh, it looks like so-and-so is having a hard time getting finished fast enough. Can you help them out? What tools can you put away? Um, I'm still do I still do that, right? Um, I do think that as far as stations and uh, cleanup, sometimes it can get a mess, you know? Kids are really um, inundated with creating and they don't want to take the time to clean. So I get that. Um, and sometimes I take a, a reboot day and I say, okay, we're all going to start today by cleaning, um, and organizing. Cause that's really important that we all know where materials and tools are. Um, occasionally I'll find a tool that's broken or something. And I constantly remind them, I'm not angry. Please don't hide this from me. Please share it with me so that I can purchase something new or I can understand why it broke so that maybe, you know, maybe it's a cheap tool and I can say, yep, I don't know what to say. It's a cheap tool. This is what we had, we can afford. Um, and then we move on and it's okay. And sometimes they're really expensive things. And I say, okay, well that stinks. We learned. And you know, maybe then I learned like I need to do more supervision over that particular item or whatever it is. Um, so as far as cleanup, they do really take ownership over that because we don't have supplies for everybody. Um, and they, the tools go away, um, in drawers and things like that. And I, I do have to say that on the whole, kids are pretty good, at least at my school. I don't think it's across the board. I think it's just in my classroom. I don't know. They really do take ownership of the space when it is their space. 
um, and that they know that they need to hold each other accountable because they need to use those tools the next day. Sometimes kids like hoard tools, which is like not good. They'll put them in their drawer and for the next day. And I'm like, where's my tool? Um, so you just have to remind them too, that if they want something special, we can talk about that. Um, but we need to share. Um, how do you handle the variety of materials you need for such a center student centered projects like funding? That's a Really good question because I still struggle with this. Um, especially, I say a great example would this be um, in AP. So in jewelry metals or in photography or in sculpture and ceramics, I have materials that are around that students can use. But when it gets above and beyond what they cannot use, um, like materials that... So, so a good example would be in AP, my 3D class, they might... Students might be like, can I use this balsa wood or whatever? And if I have a project plan for that or something planned for that for my sculpture class, then no, they can't, right? That's something I purchased spe specific for that. Um, I've tried a myriad of different ways of like through their proposals. Sometimes that helps because if you get an artwork proposal, you can say, okay, all the materials that you've listed, um, I don't have this and I can't provide it because it's too expensive and we just don't have that. So if you want to go out and get it, go for it. Or if you want to get it from Amazon, go for it. Um, otherwise, you're going to have to look at the constraints and that's a piece of that. Like artists can't just, you know, I can't just go willy nilly and get whatever I want. Um, I would love to do it, be independently wealthy to do that, but I can't, right? So even I have limitations as an artist of what I can and cannot use. Um, so that's really helpful that um, sometimes that's the case. I just, I say like, you're going to have to go to Ace Hardware and pick up a few of these things, you know, and I can give you suggestions on where to get them. I can give you suggestions on uh, what kinds will work great. I can send you links. Um, sometimes if they want me to purchase something and it's something I know that I could use in my class, like I could order bulk of and I could use for something else. Um, I tell them to send me a link or an Amazon link or something like that of what they want. Um, and we kind of go from there, but I am a little bit of a hoarder in my classroom. I have a lot of recycled materials, um, all over the place because I want them to think outside the box and how can you use, um, more sustainable items too, and not just always buying new things. In a high school where painting, drawing, ceramics, photo, graphic design are each housed in different rooms, I did answer this, um, okay, how can you offer them interdisciplinary choices where they might have to go to another room which is occupied by other classes, thanks. So I think I did answer this during the webinar, but I do wanna address the fact that I am, my biggest problem is, um, I keep saying my biggest, I have a lot of big problems, I guess, but um, one of my problems is when my students get to AP, if they have been like, kind of tracked on their own into a specific medium. Um, my next goal for our department is to figure out how to integrate other materials along the way or expose students in different capacities. So one way I do is I encourage, um, I ask teachers to encourage other students to take other content specific classes that they would be interested in if they're planning on specifically taking AP. If not, I would still encourage them to take different um, classes, right? So if you're in ceramics, I highly suggest you take a drawing class. Our drawing teacher is phenomenal. You know, if you're in a jewelry metals class, I say take a sculpture class. Or if a student is in photography and you see that they really like using their hands, go take a ceramics class. Our ceramics teacher is amazing at, you know, um, SEL skills or whatever it is. Like all of these pieces kind of go together. You worked together with your department. So that's one way. The other way is, is that um, kind of doing that trickle down that I, I, I want to work on or focus on in our department in the next upcoming years. We have other things to focus on right now. Um, but I want us to focus on how to um, kind of uh, incorporate other materials to expose students to other ways of thinking. Um, of making art because we are not, artists are not isolated in one media. So as a photographer, you could be straight up photography and that's fine, um, but you should be exposed to a lot of different ways of creating, whether that's printing that out, um, turning it into a sculpture, doing a mixed media piece, um, doing liquid emulsion on top of a ceramics piece. I don't know, right? Whatever it is, I want my students to be as um, exposed to way artists think and work as closely as possible. Um, so 
yes. So going into another room, you have to be cognizant of your teachers and their schedules and their materials. I don't just say like, go into the drawing room, grab some paper. Like she's got stuff planned, right? Um, so I also need to make sure that if I want to bring stuff into my cl- curriculum, that I also need to bring materials into my classroom um, to make it accessible. So I do make sure that I have all of those things, a, a smattering, right, available. Um, do you have suggestions for very small spaces? I have five small tables that fit four comfortably and I have five to six per table and barely enough room to move around. Oh my gosh, I know it. Okay, so you saw in my time lapse, hopefully you guys were able to access that, um, what my classroom looks like. Now my class is much bigger now, not size-wise, student-wise. My jewelry program I started from scratch and I had like five kids with another, like three other classes combined, kind of like my sculpture. And now I have literally two, you know, I had whatever. I now have like two sections of jewelry one, um, which is just exploded and they're always overloaded. I mean, I have a hard time saying no um, to students who want to take my class because I want them to have that opportunity and to be able to move on. That's how I grow my program, but it stinks because also, you're taking on more, you know, and we are a union-based um, state, union-based district. And so there are things that I could grieve or whatever, but I don't want to. I want, I really want to have those kids in my class. So my classroom is very tight. Um, those desks are kind of put into pods. I find that really important. It used to be like lined out, whatever. No, I want them as big as studio space for them to work as possible. Um, and then students are all around that. But because of the way the tables are sitting or the way they are made, um, they're the like science lab tables. You can't really fit students in them properly because the legs are too tight um, or too narrow. So a chair doesn't actually fit in there. It's really, really challenging. Um, I would say, um, and, and I try to pack. So now that classroom has sometimes somewhere between um, 28 and 32 kids in there, um, depending on what it, what class I'm teaching or how I'm combining things, but <clears throat> it's tight. It's very, very tight. Um, the best I can say is making sure that your tools are around the room um, so that students can get up and get what they need when they need it, being able to maybe put things into containers so that even if you're separating them out into different amounts so that students can put stuff in a container and bring it back to their table. I think that might be a good idea. Um, it's just really hard to, yeah, to work. I to- I don't really think I have a solution for that right now. I have to think about that. That's a tough one. Um, <clears throat> I do notice that it's important that I like my students to move around Um, I don't want them sitting at a table the whole time. They sit at at a desk during their English class most of the time, right? Or, you know, whatever class. I want them to use this as a a, a kinesthetic experience as well. Um, So I don't know. Um, Maybe you and I could talk separately. (laughs) Contact me and let me know. We can brainstorm some ideas. Um, And then this other question came up. Do you need to purchase twice as many supplies to have enough for the technical and conceptual stages of art making. I did answer this in the webinar, no. Um, It's just they're grouped, kids are grouped and then they flip flop and um, I build those conceptual as the technical, same thing. It's not like one or the other. Okay, so that's halfway through all of my questions. Not even, it's crazy. There's so many questions. You guys asked really good questions. I'm gonna pause here. Um, and maybe make a second, a couple other videos so you guys can just access the way you want. So the next video will have logistics, grading assessment, feedback, alignment, and other. Um, I will talk about COVID and then demo my canvas. Oh my gosh, so much. You guys are amazing. Okay.